That's a prayer of your life, yet not I, but through Christ in me. You may be seated. Thank you. As we come into our missions focus, just an update this morning. I got word from some of the pastors in Mbali, Pastor John and Pastor Michael Mwasa and some of the other pastors there in the Mbali area. They are preparing to have an outreach up to Karamoja. Does Karamoja need the gospel? It needs the gospel. Amen. We have some that are here from that region, uh, but they're preparing to go up in March, and so they've asked us to pray for that, so just be thinking about that. As it gets closer, I'll remind us of all the dates. If I tell you now, you'll forget, right? So I'll put that on the calendar coming up, but uh, it's an opportunity that we can help them with the expenses. They're going to go up, and there's a cost for food and transport, uh, 350 bottles of water, and other things that they need for the journey. So we'll be talking about that more on Tuesday as we uh, have our normal missions offering evening, uh, but would love to be able to help with that. But just think about that and be praying for them as they prepare for that outreach to Karamoja, excited about that opportunity that God's giving them. Our mission's focus this week is Calvary Radio in Gulu and our good friend, Brother Axis Twinney, and uh, the other staff there at Calvary Radio. I was talking with their pastor this week, and God's continuing to use that ministry, and they're having outreach in the villages and different areas. God's blessing. So thank you for, for your support of that ministry. We buy Yaka. You can't run a radio without power. So that's our support. We buy electricity uh, for them, and not all that they need, but we do contribute towards that so we can have a part in their ministry. So let's have a time of prayer for uh, Calvary Radio and Gulu, and then we'll continue with our announcements. Heavenly Father, thank you for the fact that you are the all-powerful God, and that though Satan is the prince and the power of the air, you still own the air, and you can use the airwaves, you can broadcast your truth, and people can hear it. I don't understand how the technology works, Father, but I'm thankful it does. Thank you for Calvary Radio and their commitment to preaching the gospel and distributing your truth so that people can hear regardless of 
background, of income, of religious upbringing, the word is preached. And faith is achieved because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. We pray that you would protect their equipment, protect their studio, protect their staff, not just from physical attack, but from temptations and from things that could lead them away from ministry. We pray for those that are preaching and teaching that they would be faithful to your word. And we pray for those that listen, that they would be saved and that they would grow in their faith and their service for you. Thank you again for this opportunity and that we can be a part of it through our missions program when we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, some announcements for what's coming up here the next few days. I remember our lead class, we started watching videos this past week. Next Sunday, after the morning service, we'll have about 20 to 30 minutes uh, that we'll be discussing those videos. If you're in that lead class, it'll be lessons two through nine. Remember, there is no lesson one. Don't you wish all classes were that way? But anyway, uh, lessons two through nine, we'll be discussing those next Sunday after the main service. If you have trouble with the videos, please contact me. And if you want to join in the class and you, you missed it, you can get caught up, but this would be the last week to, to join. Uh, so please talk to me after the service or contact me during this week. Uh, also coming up uh, this afternoon is the last half of our marriage conference. That'll be from 2.30 up to 4.30 p.m. today. So married couples, uh, please remember to be here for that. And we still have a door prize and other things to exchange and probably more chocolate and coffee and tea. So that's important. But most importantly, the word of God and the lessons that we've been learning. Uh, so be here for that today. Singles. We've not forgotten you. Uh, you don't come this afternoon. That's not for you. But on the 16th, on the 16th, that's a, a public holiday for many people. So on the 16th in the afternoon, we'll set the time, but probably around 2 or 3 o'clock, um, we'll plan to meet somewhere. And what we're suggesting for this time is we will meet at probably a restaurant, and you can buy water, juice, soda, whatever you want. That's your fee. There's no fee to attend. Just buy what you want to drink. If you want chips or something, that's up to you. But we'll just meet and we'll have a time of fellowship and discipleship and games and just enjoy a uh, enjoyable time for the singles to be together. I know I'm not single. I'm not pretending to be single or claiming to be single. I will be there to facilitate the singles. But I'm very happily married, just to make that clear. Uh, <laughs> don't want there to be confusion if you see me at the singles fellowship Why I'm there. Uh, facilitation. All right. Uh, we have a new song of the month that we'll be singing here shortly, but if you want to, to listen to it during the week, you can go online and listen to that. Uh, so you'll have that opportunity. I don't remember what's next. Next slide. I keep forgetting. Tithes and offerings. Thank you for your faithfulness. Our report for January is on the back of your bulletin. I did not print the whole report this month. I forgot. I apologize. I'll try to bring that Tuesday, and it will be posted for next week, and we'll have that out. So you can check the entire month. But thank you for your faithfulness in giving, and our missions giving enables us to help the churches in Mbali as they go to Karamoja. And in fact, if you want to join them, I think it's like the 13th through 17th they're going to be in Mbali, uh, I mean going from Mbali. If you want to join them, we can contact them and, and maybe help you with that as well. But our missions giving is going to get the gospel in places where we are not, where we can't go personally or we can't stay there personally, but they still need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so thank you for your faithfulness in your missions giving. Building, we're still waiting on, on building to begin, but by faith we trust that will be soon. So again, we thank you for your faithfulness. Is there anyone here other than Pastor Ellis for the first time today? Anyone, this is your first time? If you'll just raise your hand and wave at us so we know. Anyone for the first time? Very first time others have been here before. It's great to see you all back. Let's stand and greet one another, and then we'll continue with our service today.
good, good, good. All right, I think everybody's finished saying hi and talking about the week. You know, we mentioned in How to Study the Bible uh, today in our Bible study, iron sharpening iron, and this is a great time where you can share what God is doing in your life to each other. So we're very thankful for those opportunities. It's just hard to get you to stop. But let's all stand together. I know you were standing there for a moment. Let's all stand together, and we will remain standing after this song for the reading of our scripture. But we're going to sing a song called the Reformation Hymn. We trust what? We trust God's word. Uh, we have to make sure that when someone is preaching, someone's talking to you and trying to help you in your life, that it matches what God is saying in his word. And this is what this song is about. We will trust God's word alone which tells us his perfect will for our lives. So listen to the words, let them speak to your heart as we sing this song together. We will trust God's word alone where his perfect will is known our tradition shifts last or that first statement he has freed us he will keep us till we're safely home pastor dan if you remain standing for the reading of god's word pastor dan will come thank you pastor tony if you need to borrow a bible this morning we'd love for you to follow along in the word of god just raise your hand and we can share one with you anybody need to borrow a bible today there's some pastor tony could you help me with that just raise your hand and we'll give those for use during the service you can just give it back afterwards one there, bring another one out just in case. We'll be reading from Matthew 23. Now, how many of you are, are using the whole Bible, daily Bible reading plan this year? If you've done your reading today, you've already read this. Maybe you read it yesterday because it's for the weekend. This, I think this is the only time all year that it's going to overlap. It was like, wow, I didn't even plan it. 
God planned it. So this was part of this weekend's Bible reading. Matthew chapter 23, uh, verse 1 to 22 is our study today, but our reading is from verse 10 up to verse 12. I'll read verse 10 and verse 11, and I'll ask you to join me on verse 12 as we read from Matthew chapter 23. Starting in verse number 10, Jesus says, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Verse 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Remain standing for our song of the month. All right, thank you, Pastor Dan. How many of you have listened to this song at least once on YouTube? Okay. Hey, five people singing. You know, we'll get this song down definitely as we get into the third and fourth week of the month. I love this song. Very powerful song. The title can tell you how powerful it is. It was finished on the cross. What was finished? Payment for our sins. We were captive slaves. We were bound in chains of sin. And when Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, not stop there, he rose again. We were given the opportunity for freedom. So let's sing this song together. Join with me. We'll, I'm sure you'll listen to it through the first time. Maybe we'll sing it through twice. But maybe by the time we get to that second verse, you'll have the tune down, okay? Once we all stood as captive slaves, the bonds of sin and death are chains, but he with blood our freedom bought. It was finished on the cross. It was finished on a great start. It was finished on the cross, and we'll get this song as we go throughout the month. You may be seated. Thank you for singing today. I want to say a big thank you to our musicians as well for their hard work and preparation. Pastor Dan. 
I'm not sure that song of the month is the easiest to play or lead singing, but I appreciate our musicians working on that. I'm thankful for the message, and uh, I do pray that it will prepare us for the message from God's Word today. If, uh, if you'll take your Bibles and turn back to Matthew chapter 23 with me, Matthew chapter 23, if you have your, your book uh, on judgment, we'll be on page 19, looking at religion versus the king. Now, I have a few books left, so it's been a little while since we've asked, is there anyone who never has received a book and you need a book? Anyone who's never received, you need a book? If you lost it, I want to give it to people who didn't have it first. But if you've never received a book, just raise your hand and we'll give one to you. And we'll be finishing this up in just a few weeks. Um, actually, let me see how many weeks do we have left. Uh, we covered most of those. Yeah, just a few weeks left. And then we will um, we'll be going to a new series, finishing out the book of Matthew with uh, sacrifice. And that will bring us up to Easter. So I'm looking forward to that. Matthew chapter 23 this morning. And we're thinking about religion versus the king. Now, we're having marriage conference, so some people might wonder, what is, shouldn't we be talking about like love and relationships? And we are, and you'll see how that fits into our message today here in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, but really, our, our love for God does affect in that relationship. And just like the marriage relationship, our relationship with Christ is not based on performance, but on a covenant. I mean, if, if our marriage ended every time we made a mistake, um, we'd need a lot of marriage conferences. <laughs> our marriages are based on the covenant that we made an agreement before God and these witnesses. Really, we made a covenant that we will stay with this person, that we will be married until what? Death do us part. And so the the relationship of marriage, it's based on that covenant, not on our performance, because the reality is every one of us fail in our performance, in marriage, at work, and in our relationship with God. There are times of failures. And so thinking about that in the marriage context, I think that will help us in looking at the passage today in our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is not based on our performance but on the covenant relationship and God's promise, as we sang earlier, He is the one who keeps us. It's not us. It's not because of what we do. It's because of what Christ has done that we have salvation and we remain in salvation. Well, in our passage today, Jesus is still response, in His response to the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees who were trying to trap Jesus. By the way, they failed. If you missed that last couple weeks, they failed to trap Him. But now Jesus is using them and using their actions as an illustration to warn the multitude. In verse number one, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. He wasn't just taking the 12 aside and said, hey, guys, you know what those, those Herodians and the Pharisees, what they did. Let me tell you, let me warn you. Jesus' warning was not just for a few. It's for everyone. It, it's for all because there is... There is a, a, a disease, there is a cancer of religion that is throughout society, and Jesus wants all to be warned. But it must have been very disappointing for Jesus. Remember, Jesus is God, right? And Jesus, as God, was, was present at creation. He was involved in the creation. All things were made by Him and for Him. And so as we come down through history in the book of Genesis, which we won't go through today, God calls out the nation of Israel and says, I want to use you to demonstrate to the world who I am. And he gives them a series of laws of worship. And what is worship? It's to worship God, right? But they had taken them and distorted them and perverted them and changed them and added to them and, and adjusted them to where they had their own system of legalism and their own system of you won't be accepted unless you do this, it had become selfish. And how disappointing for Jesus, for these religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, to totally reject him when the entire system of worship was a shadow to point to him. I just can't imagine the rejection 
But yet in Isaiah we were told he was despised and rejected. But the very ones who were supposed to know better than anyone else, they had distorted the worship that God had given them. But you know what? I think the same thing's happening to Christianity. Where do we get the name Christianity? The first few letters are Christ. Who's it supposed to be about? Christ. Where is our uh, focus to be? Christ. Who are we to worship? Christ. Who is our attention on? Christ. It should be. But there's these elements of religion that want to come in and draw our attention away from Christ and to each other. In reality, it's to ourselves. And so Jesus here is exposing the spiritual bankruptcy, the valueless aspect of religion. And it was right for Jesus to warn not just the 12 who would be the church leaders. This is not just for those in leadership. Jesus spoke to the multitude and said, I want to warn you about religion. This is a warning that everyone needs to hear. So in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples and in verse 2, he says, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. The first thing I want to look at is the scribes versus the scripture. The scribes versus the scripture. And the first thing we see, the scribes and the Pharisees read the law. They were the, the teachers of the law. Jesus said they sit in Moses' seat. They were the descendants of the lawyers, the scribes, the ones who were responsible of teaching the law. They had that responsibility they had that authority to teach the law but the problem is they had taken God's law and added to it and changed it and and repurposed the law to fit their own desires and their own intentions uh, I don't want to compare it uh, too much but we we've all probably had experience where there was a rule which is a good rule but there is someone in authority that used that rule and manipulated it for their own benefit. Maybe to get money, maybe to get control over an individual. It, it could be a teacher, it could be someone in government, it could be somebody in a, in a business setting. But people that take what was designed to be good and distort it and pervert it for their own selfish corruption. That was the scribes. And, and Jesus is challenging them. They had misused and replaced Scripture much like the religions of today. People take God's Word and they'll take a portion of it and say, well, this is what it means, and that was never the intention of God. It's definitely not what it means in Scripture. But they use it in religion to convince people to do what they want. And so Jesus is telling them, what they tell you from the Scriptures, do. Observe and do obey the scriptures, but don't copy the people that are reading it. Probably most of us, if we go back to to, to many of, of our villages, will be challenged to find good churches. Maybe your village has one, but it doesn't take long to go to another village that doesn't have a church that's preaching the truth of the word of God. In many of our villages, there's only one or two churches of any type. And yet there are people in those villages that are going, at least the word of God is read. And the example for them here is, do what the scriptures say, do what you hear, but don't copy the readers. Because our pattern should not be our religious leaders. We're not supposed to conform to a religion, we're supposed to be conformed to what? The image of Jesus Christ. Because we are... Christians were supposed to be following Christ, not a particular religion. And Jesus said they read, but they don't obey. James 1.22 tells us, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Now we can't do what we don't know. We need to hear the word of God. It's, it's important, it's necessary to come together 
for the preaching of the Word of God. It's important for us to attend the Bible studies and to, to worship God together, but it's not enough just to hear. We must hear and do. And that was the problem Jesus was saying of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, they, they tell you to do it, but they don't do it themselves. We have a modern phrase that says, practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. And you're like, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, <laughs> what we speak, we should do. And if we say, I'm a Christian, if we say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, our actions should demonstrate what we say. Because the reality is, you can learn from somebody's words, but you learn much more from their actions, right? If you tell your children to, okay, you, you need to be ready to go to church at 9 a.m., and you're never ready at 9 a.m., will your children be ready at 9 a.m.? No matter how much you say, they watch what you do. The same in the workplace. If you have a boss that says, these reports must be in by 25th, but they never ask for the reports, they never do anything with the reports until 30th. Do you keep preparing them on 25th? Because from their actions, you realize the words are just words. I wonder how often in our lives we say, oh, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I love God, yet our actions speak something differently. And Jesus is warning here, that should not be. He said, what the scriptures tell you, what they read for you from the word of God, do it. But if they're not obeying it, don't copy them. Because they read, but they don't obey. The scribes had the authority to read and teach the word of God. But it's not enough for us to teach, we need to obey. Next we see the Pharisees, and, and I, Jesus grouped them together. But here in this passage we see a comparison with the Father. Let me read from verse 5 to 12. But all their works they do for to be seen of men... They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, put down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. <clears throat> Jesus points out that the, the Pharisees, the scribes as well, they did their works to be seen of men. Which means if nobody's looking, they're not doing. But when somebody's watching... Oh, It says they make broad their phylacteries. There, were, there was an instruction, an illustration that God gave to, to bind God's word on you. Like be, just have it always with you. Well, they wanted to show, look, we have huge portions of scripture bound to us. And, and they make their, uh, the borders of their garments huge. In, in a, a devout Jew will have some basically like strings hanging off the end of their their clothes, and, and that's just to be a reminder to them, but the, the Pharisees would make them very large so that everyone could see their big strings. Um, it would be like if, if God had commanded us to wear a tie, okay? The Bible doesn't command that, okay? Uh, but if the Bible commanded men to wear a tie, and so I had a big tie that came down to my knees so that everyone could see my tie, does that make me more spiritual? No, it just makes it more obvious that I'm wearing the tie. But that would be to be seen of men. Because does, is God saying, Dan, your tie's a little bit too small for me to see from heaven. My eyesight's not that good. Does God have a problem with eyesight? No. It's not about the outward. It's about the attitude of the heart. Verse 6, it says, They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. They maneuver to be in the best places to be seen of men. And he says, don't, don't be like that. Don't follow that example. They are more concerned about what people see than what God sees. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the, the heart. 
In verse 7, he says, they love the greetings in the markets to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. But he says, don't be called rabbi. Don't look for titles. They were demanding respectful greetings. In, in churches today, many see, are seeking positions. Oh, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a bishop. I want to be a pastor, a deacon, a, a prophet. In Jesus' day, the desire was to be called rabbi. Remember, last week we studied the scribe that came, and came to Jesus and said, Master, was God, was Jesus his master? No. I mean, he was, but he didn't re respect him as a master. He was rejecting him, trying to trap him. But, oh, let me give you this title because they were all about titles. Are there people today that are all about titles and positions? There are. But Jesus said, don't, don't go demanding these titles. And, and the, the Pharisees here, not only were they seeking the titles, they were using that to grab, to, to usurp the respect that belongs to God. He says, don't be called rabbi, for one is your master. There's only one master, that's Christ. And all ye are brethren. Jesus is the ultimate true teacher, the ultimate rabbi. And so he's the only legitimate successor to Moses for giving, for giving us this new teaching. And he says, all of you are brethren. We're all siblings. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, it's a privilege for me when we have baptism, especially when it's the children that come. Because you could have a child of maybe 9, 10 years old, and I get to baptize and say, I baptize you my brother or my sister. Because in Christ we are all on equal standing as siblings. He says, you're all brethren. It doesn't matter what your responsibilities are in the ministry, whether you're a pastor, a teacher, an usher, a member, an attender, whatever it may be. In the family of God, we all have equal standing before the throne. He is equally our father. We all have equal access. We all have equal responsibility to him with our lives. But there's no need for, well, I'm this, and so I'm, I'm better than you. No. None are better than other. We were all dead in trespasses and sins. And the only life that we have is the life that we received from Jesus Christ, who quickened us, who made us alive when he gave us the gift of eternal life. My life is no better than your life or stronger or more, more acceptable to God. My acceptance to God is because of Jesus Christ's life. Not because of what I do, not my performance, but Jesus Christ. And your acceptance to God is based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when we try to get this title or position so that we can think we're better than others, we are trying to take respect that belongs to God alone. Because the only thing good in me is the God who is good that is in me. The only good thing in you, if you have Jesus Christ, is the Christ who is in you. We have no goodness. We have no merit of our own, as we sang. And so we need to recognize that these, these titles and positions, we may have different responsibilities. But that's not making one better than the other or more, more important to God than the other or more acceptable to God. These were seeking the positions and these titles. There's, Jesus notes that the word of God is authority is the authority here, and we need to humble ourselves. It's not the words of the religious leaders. Back in verse 2, he's saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, but listen to what they say. The word of God, that's the authority. When I stand up here before you, my words really don't matter. I mean, at the end of the day, they don't really matter. And some of you are amening that a little too much. But anyway, uh, the, God's word is what matters. Why do we want to make sure you have the Bible in our services, because what God says is infinitely more important than what any man could say. This is our authority. It's the Word of God. And I have the privilege of leading us in, in the study of the Word of God, but it's not me, it's not my words that are authoritative, it's the Word of God. And the Pharisees and the scribes had forgotten that. And Jesus is reminding them God's Word is who we submit to, God's Word is what we respect. And so Jesus then follows that up, saying leaders must be servants. He that is greatest among you must be your 
servant. In our church, we have our voting members. We call them servant leaders because we're supposed to lead by serving. That's what Jesus did, right? That was his example. And that's what he tells us to do. Jesus came as a servant. He served his disciples and he commands us to serve one another. That is our role because we are all on equal standing. It's not that, well, I'm the pastor. You're supposed to serve me. Would you polish my shoe? No. <laughs> That, that's, not, that's, that's not my right to demand from another because I'm, I'm a servant of God. And you're supposed to be a servant of God, not a servant to me, not a servant to another man. He said, don't call yourself rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. All you are brethren, so be servants. You need to humble yourself and God will exalt him. He commands us to serve. So if you're looking for a position... There's one position, he says, to look for. Seek to be a servant. That's, that's what he says. That's the position we should seek to be. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of vacancies in that position. Uh, the, the, they are hiring. <laughs> Seeking that position of a servant, there's opportunity. And... As we mentioned, this is the weekend of our marriage conference. This principle applies there. The, the, the home, the marriage, is the picture of the church in Jesus Christ. And Jesus told the husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself and served it. I, I think we sang, did we sing earlier? Um, no, we didn't sing that today. But we've sung it other times. Uh, the, the brethren we have met to worship song. And there's the verse that says, Christ himself will, Christ will gird himself and serve us. That's the picture. And I know culture complicates things. It doesn't matter which culture you have. Every culture deviates from the word of God. But God tells us that the husband is supposed to love his wife, to serve her as Christ, serve the church. And it's that serving husband that the wife is said to submit to. Because even before that, he says, submit yourselves one to another. Because as a husband and wife, we are brother and sister in Christ. And we have that equal standing. And so, yes, there is different responsibility, but there is still equality. And so as we apply that to marriage, we can uh, take this passage. It's for the church. It's for the home as well. <clears throat> Jesus challenged the scribes and the Pharisees' example as he's teaching the multitude but then at the end, he deals with the rules and rituals and compares that to our relationship with Jesus Christ. God's not looking for us to follow this list of rules. And if you can check it off, all right, I'm happy. Oh, you missed one. Try again next week. That, that's not how God deals with us. See, the problem of religion, among others, but religion hides salvation. Notice with me in verse 13 to 15. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I don't think Jesus was politically correct. Uh, he spoke truth when it needed to be said. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass land, sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus is not saying easy things. He's condemning the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, your religion keeps people from the kingdom of God because they think if they do this and this and this and this, God will accept them. That's religion. But they fail to put their faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they miss the kingdom of heaven because of your religion. Religion hides salvation. They trust in rituals. They trust in obedience instead of in the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And these Pharisees are, are devouring widows' houses. They are seeking and receiving offerings for their personal benefit 
rather than for the kingdom of God. And even if they use it for mission work, in verse 15 he says, you're going out, you will travel far and wide to get a proselyte to you. And because you tell them that following these rules will take them to heaven, they put their confidence in their religion and they're going to hell. Probably many of us have talked to people, perhaps you have relatives that are trapped in a religion. And, and there have been people in, in specific religions that have told me, Dan, I want to believe Jesus the way you believe Jesus, but I love my religion. Religion hides salvation. It keeps people from heaven because they think if I do these things, I'm good. Or at least I have a chance for heaven. And, and maybe even after I die, people can pray for me or pay money for me. And religion absorbs and collects money promising heaven. And it sends people to hell. Religion is not a game. It promises people life by rules, but the results are death. There's only life, eternal life is only through a relationship which comes through Jesus Christ. Not by what we do, but what Christ has done. Religion also threatens people with consequences. Verse 16, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, whether is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Or the, what is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it's nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he's guilty. They, they had found a way to make money by saying, if you swear against the temple or the altar, that's fine. But if you swear against the gold or the, the gift that's brought, well, now, if you break your promise, you have to repay that. It's all about the money. It's all about the, the, the financial, about the tangible, the touchable things, the earthly things. And it threatens people with consequences, but they forgot that judgment belongs to God. They said, if you swear by the gift, then you're guilty. But if you disrespect the temple, doesn't matter. But what's the purpose of a temple? To worship God. And they were drawing people's attention from worship to religion and keeping people from trusting and putting their faith in God. And lastly, religion steals God's glory. We've seen that in part in these verses, 16 to 18, but let me continue, 19. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift and the altar that sanctifieth the gift, or the gift, let me start again, whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift, whoso, whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Religion steals the glory of God. It focuses our attention on man and the things of this earth instead of our attention on Christ. Judaism had done it. They had, they had taken their attention from God to the temple, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to the religious leaders. And religion today does the same thing. It takes our attention off of Christ and puts it on what you do, what the church does for you, what this church leader can do for you. How many people have I talked to and asked them, how did you become a Christian? And they say, well, this pastor prayed for me and told me I was saved. It's not what a person does for you except for the person of Jesus Christ. Acts 4 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, only the name of Jesus Christ. If you've not come to salvation in Jesus Christ, if you've not come to salvation through faith in his payment for your sins, if you're trusting in, everything, in anything else, that's religion. But God is not a God that simply demands payment. He's a God who offers payment as well. He's a God of love. And God, in his love, while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8 says, God commanded, he demonstrated, he showed his love for us and that Christ died for our sins. If you want to know about love, read the book of Hosea and see the faithfulness that God demonstrates. When we go astray, he is faithful in his love. And God's desire for us 
is not that we check off a list of rules and say, well, I finished by 10 o'clock today, God. Now I can go do my thing. No, he's interested in that relationship that we respond in love to him, respond in love to others, whether it's in the church, in our homes, our marriage, in our community, that we humble ourselves, that we become that servant. Religion wants us to live in fear. God wants us to live by faith. Religion wants us to live according to a law. God wants us to live by love because it's about a relationship with him, not the religion. Do you have that relationship? Do you know for sure that you have the eternal life that God promises to give all who put their faith in him? It's not by what we do. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done. The wages of sin is death, not religion, not a list of rules. It's death. Jesus died for our sins, for my sins. He died for your sins. Have you accepted his payment for your sin? If you have, what are you living like? We're not saved by religion. We can't live by religion. We're saved by grace through, and we must live by faith. Living it out out of love. What's your motivation? Is it because God's loved you? Because he loved me first, I'm going to love him. Or is it, well, if I don't do this, God's going to get me. That's not the God we have. Oh, he will correct us. Don't, don't think that he won't correct us. But he will not throw us away. And his way is always the best way. He corrects us because he knows how much good he has for us in his way. And we can trust him. Not religion, but our king. Will you stand with me as we close this morning? I don't know what it is in your life that we're tempted to check the box and move on, but I would dare say that each of us have had those moments that we just want to get it done and then, God, I've got things I need to do. Coming to church, is it a box we check or is it worship? As we go to the Word of God, is it a box we check or is it our love for Him? As we teach our children, as we talk to others, are we trying to get them to conform to our standards or to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. See, it doesn't work any better in the home than it does in the church. I need to demonstrate the love of Christ, the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, and teach my children to conform to his image, <laughs> certainly not mine. What is it today that we've been checking the box instead of worshiping? Heavenly Father, you are worthy. And so many times we become like the scribes and Pharisees that we tell and we don't do. Or we do outwardly, but our hearts are distant, insincere, hypocrites. Father, I pray that you would expose those areas in our lives that we would submit to you, that we would humble ourselves in those areas, that we would return to worship, not outward appearance, not putting on so others will say we are holy, but putting off the things that displease you, the pride, the arrogance, those things which you hate, put them off. And we put on the new man in Christ. Not so people will see us, but so that they'll see Christ. And that Christ would live through us. Christ is our life. Father, I pray for the one or two among us today that don't have that life. I pray that you'd give them courage to come and talk to us. Give us the opportunity to show them from your word how they can receive your gift. It's not from us, but you have told us how they can receive it, and we'd love to show them if they would come to us. I pray that they would do that today. I pray for Christians that we'd come to you with sincerity, honesty, and humility. Not so people will admire us, but so that people would see Christ. Not for a position other than servant, 
because we have one master. We have one Father. And Father, our desire is to worship you. May we live that out this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.